you for the cross, Lord. Thank you for the price you paid, bearing all my sin and shame. In love you came and gave a
Jesus, thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Church in Bethesda's online broadcast. My name is Ryan Phipps. I'm the senior minister. If you've been here before, welcome back, and a very special welcome to you if it's your first time with us today. This is also a first time for me uh, broadcasting this intro from my bed in the rectory. I have caught some type of cold this week and have just been unable to get up out of the bed without having the spins. For those of you that are thinking COVID, 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 I'm not running a fever. I'm not experiencing any respiratory symptoms or any other COVID symptoms. So set your minds at ease there. Today, rather than me uh, giving you a NyQuil version of a brand new sermon, I am going to spare you and reach back into the archives and share with you something that is equally important to our lives today uh, in this place. A message on the topic of belonging from a few years back, and I know you'll be blessed by it. Thank you again for joining us today. Before we get into today's lesson, let's greet one another in the comments threads with the peace of Christ. You can do that in the comments thread of whichever platform you are joining us on. Let's greet one another now. Thanks for being here. I enjoy the weeks where the daily office just gives me a short passage to speak on on Sundays because in some ways it forces me to think about the passage more deeply. I don't have the luxury of drifting here and there amongst the stack of different Bible verses. And I will say that thinking about and studying through and praying through this passage over the past six days has reminded me of some foundational things in my life and in my faith that I often forget. In this passage, the word earth that's used there, you'll notice it's not capitalized. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and the word for earth used here isn't talking about the planet earth. It's talking about earth in the geological sense. The land, the soil, or the ground, the stuff that we walk on, the stuff that we fall on and skin our knees and our elbows on. Now, the word world here that's used in this passage is referring to the planet and all the things that live on it and in it. That's you, that's me, that's your neighbor, that's your neighbor's dog, 
Frogs, cats, jellyfish, plankton, zebra, rattlesnakes, trees, moss, flowers, mushrooms, crabgrass, etc., etc., etc. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. What's that trying to get across to us here in modernity? What's the writer trying to make clear to us? Simply this, that everything belongs to something. Everything, everything belongs to something. It is concerning to me how often I forget this in my own life. When I go through my stuff, my things in my life, when I'm confronted with situations or experiences or challenges, the first thoughts that often come to my mind are thoughts like, well, what, what am I going to do to fix this? What should I do now? What do I need to change? How am I going to weather this? What do I need to adjust here and here and over there so that I can integrate this new challenge into my system of living? These are good thoughts to have. It would actually be bad if I didn't think those thoughts. But in the midst of these thoughts, I often just synaptically respond as if there's nothing that cares for me or knows that I'm struggling. As if all that is and how it pans out is up to me and me alone. And in truth, I suppose that it is. But if that's true, then it's also up to me whether or not I acknowledge God in my troubles. Perhaps the place that we see this kind of relationship between us and God more clearly than anywhere else is in the skill of parenting. All parenting, in my opinion, is improvisation. None of us who are parents have any idea what we're doing. We never tell our kids that. But we know it's true. Am I right? Yes. And children of parents in the room today, do not quote this to your parents later when you get in an argument, all right? This is not ammunition for you. I find for myself, at the very core of parenting, that it's, it's just a balancing game. It's about giving my kids enough freedom to learn for themselves and yet at the same time keeping them on a long enough tether in case they get in over their heads so that I can rein them in and rescue them if they go too far. I'll give you an example. My son, Alec, who is four and a half years old, he loves this park down Arlington Road here by the library. I can't remember the name of it. And in this park, it's, it's a nice park, um, there's this twisted metal climbing thing that he likes to climb on, but it, it goes up pretty high for a four and a half year old. And he goes into this park and he sees it and he just makes a beeline for it and he starts climbing on it. And I know from experience, because we've been there a thousand times, I know that he's going to get all the way up to the top. And then once he's up there, he'll realize how high up he is. And he just gets paralyzed with fear and he's unable to climb down. What do I do when this happens? I'll tell you exactly what I do. He's up there sometimes sobbing and shaking in fear. And I yell across the park to him, you got yourself up there, so get yourself down. I didn't put you up there. You chose to put yourself in this mess. Good luck. And I just leave him up there alone while he shakes and he cries. A couple of times he's even fallen off and hurt himself. 
but that's the only way he'll learn, right? Of course I don't say that to my kids. You, you think I'm a monster? No, of course not. If I'm at that park with him and I'm sitting on the bench watching him play, and he goes over and he starts climbing up the twisted tower thingy, I get up off the bench and I move a little closer to him in case he needs my help. Someday soon, I'm sure he'll be able to climb to the top of the thing and not need my help to get down. But until then, I move closer to him. Number one, so that he knows that I'm there. And number two, so that he doesn't feel alone and abandoned when he realizes that he's taken his freedoms further than his development. And I think that this is how God is with us. What's more, I think that we're that way with our kids because we're created in God's image. It's no wonder that when we read through the Gospels in the New Testament, Jesus so often begins his prayers with the word Father instead of something else. And this is the one thing that will make us or break us in our belief systems. Serious question this morning. Does God love you or does God hate you? Maybe that's too extreme, too lofty to ask it that way. How about this? Does God like you or does God dislike you? Maybe that's even too far out there. Let's just make it real basic. Is God even aware of your existence? Or is he just clueless about you? And all that I'm asking you to consider today, wherever you are on the spectrum of this thing that we call belief, all that I'm asking you to consider today is the possibility that maybe, just maybe, God might actually love you. God might actually like you. God might actually be aware of you. God might actually notice you. Your life, your successes, your failures. It might just be that God is trying to get a little bit closer to you. Especially when you're stuck and you can't get out of it. Even if it's your fault. If you're not open to that, that's okay. Belief is not a requisite to experience the love and the goodness of God. But this is where many of us just kind of spend months, maybe even years, just teetering back and forth. When everything is bright and wonderful, we go, oh, there is a God. When everything is dark and terrible, we go, there can be no God. There's a gnat. <laughs> and all that this passage is wanting us to realize is that in both the good and the bad, and in the dark and in the light, in pain and in pleasure, 
that we always have and always will belong to God. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Are you standing on the earth? Are you sitting on the earth this morning? Well, guess what? You belong to God. The world and all who live in it. Elon Musk may colonize Mars in my lifetime, but we're all still here on the earth. And as long as we are, we belong to God. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. That is not being posited as a subjective choice that we make, but as an objective reality that we live inside of, that we cannot escape. How would that impact the world if we just gave believing that a try? Would we treat one another better? Would we be more honest with each other? Would we love one another more authentically? I would be a calloused soul this morning were I not to say that I've been thinking so much about the shootings that have happened in recent days. California, yesterday, Texas, early this morning at about 5.30 a.m., Dayton, Ohio. I was wondering when, you know, you have these news alerts pop up on your phone. I, I started thinking about this passage and I was wondering if the shooters in those situations, if they truly believed that they belonged to something bigger, maybe even a god, and that even in a state of hatred and insanity, that that God was trying to get close to them. Would they have chosen to do what they did? Or what if those shooters believed, like really believed, that the people in those places where that violence took place also belonged to God. Would they have harmed them? I don't know. I hope not. I think about it and I ask myself, how can someone do that? And I'm reminded that these are the desperate actions of someone who feels as if they don't belong to anyone or anything. What's more is that they feel that no one belongs to anyone or anything. That life is just a random lottery of meaningless tragedy and a series of near escapes. That there's just there's nothing precious about it. It's just disposable. If you don't like it, you just extinguish it. And yet the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world and all who live in it.
even those who kill the people in it. Really believing that and really taking that to heart won't make everything in this life compute. Really believing that certainly doesn't mean that everything will work like we want or we'll get everything that we want. Believing that doesn't mean that everyone in your life that has the ability to impact your well-being will always make the choices you want them to make. And it certainly doesn't mean that in this life we won't experience horror and tragedy and pain. It simply means that wherever we are, whatever is, God is there and God is. And it is human choice to let God be present in our thoughts, in our words, in our actions. And if we live our lives according to that reality, we won't fix everything. But it will make things better. for kids segment. So there's a holiday coming up this week on Thursday and that holiday is Thanksgiving. On Thanksgiving we like to think about all the things that we're grateful for in our lives. Um, something else that people think about with Thanksgiving is the Native Americans. So I have a book that I would like to share with you and it's written by a woman who is a member of the Cherokee Nation. Um, and there are some Cherokee words in this book to give us a little introduction to their language. And I am going to do my best to pronunciate them well, um, but I'm not an expert, um, but I am going to give it my best um, and try to treat them respectfully. <clears throat> we are grateful. Ojaili Haliga. Cherokee people say Ojaili Haliga to express gratitude. It is a reminder to celebrate our blessings and reflect on struggles daily throughout the year and across the seasons. Oligo Husty, fall. When cool breezes blow and leaves fall, we say Ojaili Haliga. As shell shakers dance all around the fire, 
and burnt cedar scent drifts upward during the great new moon ceremony. As we clean our houses, wear new clothes, enjoy a feast, and forget old quarrels to be to welcome the Cherokee New Year. While we collect book rush and honeysuckle to weave baskets, to remember our ancestors who suffered hardship and loss on the Trail of Tears, and have hope as our Elise grandma cradles the newest member of the family and reveals his Cherokee name. Gola, winter. As bears sleep deep and snow blankets the ground, we say, Ojili Haliga. While elders share stories and we savor buttery bean bread and steamy hominy soup, when we feed our animal and bird friends, as older children teach the younger ones how to make corn husk dolls and play cane flutes. While we gather to remember an uncle who has passed on, as men cuddle babies and sing traditional lullabies in Jalagi, Cherokee. Gogai, spring. When showers fill streams and shoots spring up, we say, Ojili Haliga. While men sing, asking for thunder and lightning's protection of the emerging sprouts that women tend. As we gather wild onions, spring's first food, and serve them with hen's eggs. As we practice patience to sew pucker toe moccasins and coil clay to build beautiful pots. As we plant ani, strawberries, an ancestral story, sweet smelling reminder not to argue with each other. As we embrace a clan relative heading off to serve our country. Gogi, summer. As the crops mature and the sun scorches, we say, Ojili Haliga. When we grasp our gigs and wade into the cool creek to catch crawdads for supper. As we sink our teeth into the season's first harvest at the green corn ceremony. While we click clack sticks, chase a small ball and fling it high at the stick ball game pole. when we recall the ancestor sacrifices to preserve our way of life, to celebrate Nuli Sta Nidola, history, and listen to our tribal leaders speak at Cherokee National Holiday. Every day, every season, Ojili Haliga, we are grateful. So we hope you enjoyed the book, We Are Grateful, Ojali Higliga by Tracy Sorrell. And it was illustrated by Frenet Lassac. So we learned some new Cherokee words from this book. And I thought it could be fun to practice finding them in a word search. So we have a word search. And some of the words that were included in the book are here, as well as their English words. Where should I be? I miss you. Oh my gosh, it's been a long time. So back to the conversation. Thank you, Anna, for the book. It was wonderful. She read great. Right, guys? I, yeah, I know. Okay. So here, Anna, print these out. It's a word sheet for CRB kids. We are grateful. And I did this, all of this, because it's kind of hard. And you know, Maybe all things are a little bit hard, so your parents can help you, anybody that is your family can help you. So I was trying to make this so I can give you a like a boost and see how it's done. And yeah, so I will see you. Mm. Bye. As Linda mentioned last week, um, Christmas is coming up and we would like to be able to do something special um, for all the kids who are part of just of the CIB Just for Kids program. Um, so Ryan will have a link to this form 
um, and your parents can help you fill it out and email it to us at cibkidsprogram at gmail.com. Um, and we hope to be able to do a little something to help make your Christmas special. Um, and while we're thinking of that, we also wanted to share an invitation and an opportunity. Um, if any of you or your parents are interested in helping out with the CIB Kids program, um, you can also send an email to the same email address. Um, and we would love to have your help. Thanks.